I want to continue with our study of the identifying marks of the church of which we read about in the New Testament. I want to remind everyone, however you are viewing and studying with us, that the view people in general have of the church is what we would call a denominational view where the one church is made up of all the different denominations with different names and different this, that, or the other, even in ways of worship and different viewpoints of how man is put together and what the spirit is, what the soul is, all sorts of difference, but yet the denominational view allows for men to be divided. When the Lord prayed that we would be one, even as he and his father are one, and that Paul commanded that we all be of the same mind and the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1.10. They meant what they said. And they said exactly what they meant. And we're expected to study the word of God because it is just that, God's word. Not only in what must I do to be saved from my sins, but what must I do as a child of God in the church to which the Lord added me when I was baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. We're to do only that which Jesus Christ, who is our sovereign king, we're not in a democracy in the church, which he has ordained in his word. So we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Because that word will judge every one of us someday, John chapter 12 and verse 48. And we must all, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians, stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Well, that good or bad is dependent upon whether we adhered from the heart to the truth of God's word or whether we spurned it and did things as it suited us. So we want to be known as those who are faithful. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Since faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17, then to walk by faith and not by sight, as to walk as the word of God leads and guides, teaches and directs us. So we constantly emphasize, let's view things only through the eyes of Christ. Well, I don't know how to do that except to go to the perfect law of liberty, James 1, 25, and see things as God sees them, and see ourselves as God sees sees us and be honest with what needs to be changed in our lives and what needs to be upheld that we might walk the straight and narrow way which is the only way that's going to heaven now one of those great identifying marks of the church is that it teaches that infants are born pure they're born s-a-f-e safe they have committed no sins Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3 and verse 4. They've not done that. Now, you know as well as I do that there is a doctrine that covers a great many people who believe in Christ that says we have inherited Adam's original sin. It is called the doctrine of original sin. And it's known as hereditary total depravity. Let me read to you from the church manual designed for the use of Baptist churches by J.M. Pendleton, page 46. <clears throat> it would be unjust to leave the impression that advocates of infant baptism are the only ones who have taught hereditary total depravity. Now, that's not from the book. It's preceding the quote. The idea of being baptized as an infant usually involves pouring water on or sprinkling. Eastern Orthodox do triune baptism. They take the infant and souse him between, under the water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit each time. None of that's taught in the Scriptures. You say, well, how do you know? Because I can read and understand my mother tongue. And it communicates to me the will of heaven as it's been translated from the Hebrew and Greek. And I can know the mind of God because I can read it. So that's one of the things the red terror total depravity led to. Now, wanted to get that in there. When you read this quote, 
you find, and I'm quoting now, we believe that man was created in holiness under the law of his maker, but by voluntary transgression fell from that holy and happy state, in consequence of which all mankind are now sinners, not by constraint of choice, being by nature utterly void of that holiness required by the law of God, positively inclined to evil, and therefore under just condemnation to eternal ruin without defense or excuse. And that quote again is from Church Manual Designed for the Use of Baptist Churches by J.M. Pendleton, page 46. Notice he said, all mankind. And that doesn't leave anyone out. All mankind. That includes infants as well as adults. I don't think a blacker picture can be painted than painted by this quotation, the words in it. The question I raise in my mind, and you should raise in yours, and all men should, believing the Bible to be the very Word of God, does the Bible teach what this manual taught? Well, of course, from what I've already said, you know that I don't believe it does. And you can study for yourself, which you ought to, and learn that it doesn't. So the next part, of this lesson is going to be an examination of some text of scripture that they attempt to use to prove the doctrine of hereditary total depravity. They often use Psalm 14 verses 2 and 3. This is one of their proof texts. It says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek after God. They are all gone aside. They are together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Well, of course, it's the Word of God. I subscribe to it. Thus, I subscribe to the truth that it teaches. But all this verse is saying is that People were very wicked. There's nothing in the verse, not one word, that says they were born very wicked. Notice the passage says they are all gone aside. They are together become filthy. Well, now think for a moment. It would have been impossible for them to have gone aside and to have become filthy if they had been born that way. The fact that they went aside, the fact that they became filthy, is proof that they were not in the beginning when they were born. That is, they were not born that way. I want to pause here and point this out. Those who defend hereditary total depravity, and there's a whole host of them, they have the various versions of it, but nevertheless, uh, they teach in some way or the other, you're born in this world having inherited the actual sin that Adam originally committed back there in the garden. Now, they applied that to matters of spiritual things, to the church, to being saved. I promise you they never thought if they did, few of them ever mentioned it, and I don't know of one that did, that somebody would turn around in the area of morality, such as homosexuals, and say, we were just born that way. But those who can see that if such is true in matters of spiritual things, they can say, since God created us all, if they believe in God, then he must have created the homosexual, a homosexual from birth. But that's just not so. None of it's so. All of it is foreign to the Bible. God does not teach it. 
But there's another verse in Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So David wrote, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, if you have the international version, you'll see that it teaches plainly in the way it handles this verse that man is born in sin, having inherited Adam's original sin. If you have an international version, you turn and read it. Now, those who advocate hereditary total depravity infer that David was a born sinner by what this verse says. But the passage is not even susceptible to that interpretation. Sin is mentioned in the verse. That's obvious to anybody that can read words. But it was committed before David existed. David didn't exist when he was conceived. That's like saying I was there before I was there. So the iniquity and the sin spoken of in the passage existed before David had his existence. Notice again, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me says nothing about a baby being born having inherited Adam's original sin. Paul's statement in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3 is relied on as a proof text for this false doctrine. And you notice Paul said concerning the Gentiles in Ephesus, it would have been true of Gentiles anywhere, said they were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest, Ephesians 2, 3. And when they say by nat nature, that must mean the natural way that you are conceived and that you get here. But they fail in their understanding of the Scriptures. This term by nature does not always mean by inheritance genetically in particular here. Adam, however, does, uh, Adam Clark, that is, who is an old Methodist commentator, was a believer in hereditary depravity. But he wouldn't use this verse as a proof text. He rather said, the apostle appears to speak of sinful habits. And he got it right because he was more loyal to his Greek than he was to his human doctrine. When a people who generation after generation after generation do things, we would say it this way today, but it's just second nature to them. They don't think anything about it. It doesn't necessarily mean they've inherited it in their genes to do it. It means they've done it for so many hundreds of years, they think nothing of it. And he says, that's the way you were when I came with the gospel to you. All this idolatry and all the things that went along with it, you'd been doing for years. All you have to do is read Romans 1 and see the Gentiles' departure from God, that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them up to do all these things. That was the world and culture of the first century, and which we in America and other places are seemingly trying to emulate, grow more like every day. Point was, it was not inherited like you inherit the color of your hair from your parents all the way back to wherever. These people had done this so much, it was natural for them to do it. And that's how he uses the word nature here. Then we look to Psalm 58, 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Well, again, you have to read into that verse that is talking about hereditary total depravity in that babies are born having inherited Adam's original sin, and they're inclined to no good thing at all. This passage states that they went astray they went astray 
after they were born. It does not say they were born astray. Their going astray consisted of speaking lies. Now think about that for a minute. When is the last time you saw a newborn baby that could speak lies? Infants cannot speak lies. Therefore, this sin was not committed in infancy. Time passed till they reached the age of being accountable for their actions. And they went astray by sin. And part of it had to do with speaking falsehoods or lies. Now, those are the major texts that those who believe the false doctrine of an inherited original sin, hereditary total depravity, rely on. And we see that it's a misuse of the Scriptures when they try to quote Scripture to prove their contention. But now let's look at some passages which further refute this fallacious doctrine. In Genesis 8 and verse 21, the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Now this is said by Moses concerning the account of the Noahic flood and the events following. The question needs to be asked about this verse, Genesis 8:21. If man's heart became evil in youth, and those of you here last week, please remember what we studied about the heart, what it really means in the scriptures. If man's heart became evil from when he was a young person, then it must have been pure before such took place. Man's spirit has been given to him by his maker. That's where it came from. He, according to the writer of Hebrews, is the father of spirits. Your parents gave you your body. God gave you the eternal you, the real you. And the dust returneth to the earth as it was. And the spirit returneth unto God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Now, if God has given man a corrupted spirit, then is it not unfair and unjust for God to hold man responsible for his corruption? Of course it is, but God's a just God. We've studied that too. So God is not going to say, you must do this to be saved from your sins, but I'm going to make it impossible for you to do it. Well, that would be a monster instead of a loving God. <coughs> Paul said in his famous sermon in Athens, for we are also His, speaking of God, we are also His offspring, Acts 17, 28. We are His offspring. Well, being the offspring of God, how is it that a child of God can be depraved? Unless God is depraved. Now, who wants to affirm that? Paul plainly said, we are the offspring of God. But we're born depraved, if that false doctrine were not false. So for the offspring of God, God must be that way. But if that can't be true. The devil said who was a murderer from the beginning? And who was a liar and the father of lies? Well, it wasn't God. It was Satan. So no one could accuse God of being depraved. So why make <clears throat> the accusation against his offspring? being born, having inherited Adam's original sin, and inclined to no good thing at all. I don't even really think today that a lot of people who follow churches and are members of them who believe this heinous doctrine, and it's been around for a long, long time, really want it said very much about. Back many years ago, we were in a debate with one of these fellows out in California, we just simply took a little innocent child's picture. And you know these reindeer horns like you see around Christmas time that they put on their heads? We just had her put those horns on her head and take a picture of her and said that's how he thinks of little children. Well, he couldn't deny it because he was the one that was teaching 
that children are born having inherited in Adam's original sin, and thus they are depraved. Now, to be depraved means you can't get any worse than that. You're just as bad as it gets. And so they're saying a child born in this world is as bad as it gets. But Jesus said, suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. Well, he had just as well said, suffer little devils to come unto me if their doctrine is true. But it's not. And we need to keep that in mind. The Holy Spirit declares that the child shall not bear the iniquity of of the parent. And if there's no other verse in the Bible, that one itself should make it clear that babies aren't born in this world having inherited Adam's original sin and thus are not inclined to any good thing at all, but totally depraved. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20. In other words, if I sin, I'm responsible for it. When you sin, you're responsible for it. Now, it's true I can set a bad example before you and lead you into doing something wrong, but you still have to make the conscious choice to do the wrong as the Bible defines what's right and what's wrong. Notice that both the righteous and those who are iniquitous are those who did righteousness or they did iniquity. This goes back to our study of the heart, the inward man, the real you that dwells in this body, and the fact that you are a free moral agent. You see, they don't believe you're a free moral agent. You have no choice because you're as bad as bad gets. Thus, you're inclined to no good thing at all. So even if you make a choice, it's going to be a bad choice. And you wouldn't if you could. And you couldn't if you would. Because you're depraved, and that's the meaning of depraved. But the Bible says that you make your choices. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But you have to do the coming. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. All of it involved free moral agency. We're persuaded by the truth of God's word. We either believe it or we don't. If we don't believe it, we reject it and do not obey it. If we do believe it, we will to comply with it. And that's what we noted in Paul's writing to the Romans, reminding them of what they did in becoming Christians to exhort them to greater service. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. Ye became the servants of righteousness, Romans 6, 17 and 18. Well, they became servants of righteousness when they obeyed the form of doctrine. The form of doctrine, Romans 6, 3 and 4, was a form of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They were buried with their Lord in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Thus, Peter would say in that first Pentecost sermon the day the church started, to believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Notice that Jesus said to the Jews, except ye turn and become as little children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18, 3. And that ties back into what I said earlier when he said, uh, suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not. In other words, little children are innocent. They haven't committed any sin. And he's saying you must turn by your will once you become a sinner by hearing and understanding the gospel and the terms of pardon presented to man therein and comply with them. And that way you become as little children in being clean, in being innocent. I don't know a more horrendous doctrine that can look at a little baby and say, now there's a little devil. And yet that's how far people can go in being taught false doctrine and thinking that it's a good thing. David certainly was not of that belief. You remember the sad affair of David's adultery with Bathsheba and Bathsheba 
how he worked to get her husband killed. We're thankful the Bible tells us that he repented, which, by the way, all of that involved choice. One, choice to do evil. Other on David's part, choice to do good, for he repented. But then as a consequence, the baby died. Now, here is exactly what 2 Samuel 12, 23 records of David when he knew the child was dead. I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. But he was just an infant born having inherited Adam's original sin, totally depraved if Calvinism, which is where that comes from, is true. But David didn't seem to think that. David knew that he could go to be with him. Which, all things being scripturally equal, that's exactly the case today in eternity with David and that son. So it's impossible for sin to be inherited. I say again, sin is a choice by man to violate God's law by either commission or omission. Concerning commission, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. As to sins of omission, to him therefore that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. James 4, 17. I think most of the time, sadly, we measure whether we're right with God on the basis of whether we commit sins of commission. But the Lord tells us it's so easy to commit sins of omission. Because we tend to say, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. And all those are sins, so since I'm not doing those sins, I'm all right. The question is, what am I doing that God obligates me to do as a Christian now that I put those things out of my lives? And every picture that the Lord gave of the judgment had folks going to hell because they left undone what God obligated them to do as members of the church. And that ought to cause every member of the church to take close scrutiny when it comes to his life. But nevertheless, that's our sins committed. Then the fact that God is not given a plan for saving infants. Have you ever read in your Bible a plan for saving infants, little babies? No, there is none because they don't need saving. They are safe because they are innocent and they're not accountable for their lives. There's going to be a time in their future as they mature where they will become accountable before God for their actions, and they'll sin. As Paul said in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says plainly that the wages of sin is death. But Christ came and tasted death for every man. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by Him, John 14.6. And he said, also, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. Thus, when the gospel, the power of God to save, Romans 1, 16, is presented, the terms of pardon for sin is presented, and one must believe with all of his heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, with a belief that solely based upon the evidence contained in the Word of God, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. Having so learned, he repents of his sins, Acts 17.30, confesses his faith in Christ, Romans 10 and verse 10, completes his obedience of the gospel by being buried with his Lord in baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. And the Lord adds him to the spiritual body of Christ, the church, Acts 2.47. I want to say what I've said many times before. People say, well, I don't know how you can identify the church. Well, of course you can't if you don't know the Bible, and therefore you won't know the identifying marks of the church Jesus built. But have you ever noticed, and you read your Bible in the New Testament, that those who wanted to persecute the church had no trouble finding it at all? Well, it seems to me then that if we seek it because it's God's will and we want to be whatever God wants us to be, then if the enemies of the church can find it, and surely one who wants to be a member of it can find it. But it all comes back then to an honesty of heart, Luke 8, 15, and a desire to study the scriptures, rightly divide the word of truth, note what the church is from God's perspective and revelation, and then identify it by its identifying marks. I close by saying if any one of us, and this happens almost daily, were to all of a sudden be gone and our families couldn't find us for whatever reason, <laughs> 
we would seek identifying marks except that sets us apart from all the other billions of people on this earth so people could find us. How much more so the spiritual body of Christ is identified by the word of Christ. You can find it if you want to. You can know how to become a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. No hyphen any Christian. Just a member of the church Jesus built and purchased with his blood. And you can know the identifying marks of it. And you can will to comply with it out of a loving heart, out of faith, out of appreciation and love of God. If as a child of God you've sinned, you need to remember God's second law of pardon. You need to repent of that sin. Come confessing it and pray God for forgiveness. If you're subject to the Lord's good invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.